Welcome to Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, where we bring out the professional's experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. We believe wise investing starts with the plan. Your investments may have merit, relevance to a time and place, but this all depends on you, your objectives, and your goals. My name is Seth Crussman, and I'm here with Ben Brayshaw and John Ryder, and we're all planners and partners with Brayshaw Financial Group. Hello, gentlemen. How are you today? Good, Seth. How are you doing? Seth, good. doing great here, man. Doing great. You were, you were waiting for me to say good morning. I did a little change up. I threw you a little curveball on that one. You did. You did. <laughs> We're glad you're listening to Money on Tap. And if you're looking to sit down with an advisor, start making some of the right steps towards your financial goals, well, we welcome the opportunity to do that with you. And you can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. You can also find us at Facebook uh, or any of the podcast venues out there. We appreciate you joining us through any of these media. The title of our show today is... Tax-free streams of income for your retirement. You know, when it comes to retirement, there are a lot of people who are really feeling the crunch. And think about it, you know, year after year, the costs to live are just getting higher and higher. And Social Security is really not keeping pace with any of the retirees' needs for income. And those that have done a great job of saving for retirement are having to cut back even in their spending to make ends meet. Seth, that is so true. I just had a client the other day that was just complaining about the fact that she just does not see her Social Security increasing every year. She saw it increase last year, but then she just looked at it and she's like, wow, I just need to figure out where to get more money from. There's some some truth to that. I mean, people see the expenses that they're paying every month and they compare it and they say, man, they're just not moving in line. That's, That's happening every day with people. You know, when... When we're having conversations with our clients about income, one of the things that always comes into play are taxes that people are having to pay. When when we're putting together portfolios for people, there certainly is a lot of factors that we need to consider. Investment selection, risk aversion, uh, liquidity, all are important. But something that is becoming even more important is helping clients minimize their tax liabilities. Yeah, there's a lot of ways to help minimize taxes. And, you know, that's something that we specialize here is, is focusing on you know, either whether it's income distributions or state taxes or all different sorts of pieces. And we do everything from higher end to just kind of the basic things that people want. Well, before we uh, dig a, a six foot hole here on taxes, <laughs> like I, you like how I did that? I, I brought did. in the death and taxes <laughs> motif on <Yeah>. that. <laughs> well done, Seth. Oh, thank you. Appreciate that. <laughs> In ways which we can help you more, basically, with your hard-earned money out of pocket, it is time for Money in the News. Here we like to have a little bit of fun in our show where we discuss some of the stories that are in today's headlines, Uh, starting off with Olive Garden. Seth, I like Olive Garden. I like that. (laughs) We're talking about food already. That's a good thing, Seth. (laughs) That's a good thing, Seth. Me too. Me too. So we're uh, we're talking about Olive Garden or seeing Olive Garden in the news. It's still a hit. Uh, Basically, the the article states that Olive Garden has done it again, reported sales and earnings that topped forecast, and it also raised an outlook for the full fiscal year thanks to strong results. Uh, Olive Garden is a part of the Darden uh, a group of uh, several other restaurants, but they do uh, make up the majority of that that uh, that group. But what's most notable about the sales boost at Olive Garden is that it really didn't just rely on price hikes or menu changes to lift sales, but the traffic, the number of customers coming into the restaurants rose 1.1% for the quarter. So what that means here is that not only are, are loyal fans to the Olive Garden uh, you know, still coming back time and time again, but they're continuing to add more more clients and more customers in their doors. Seth, I have to admit that has not been me in the last several years. I haven't been to an Olive Garden forever. I don't know, Ben. Do you go to Olive Garden? I I haven't been to an Olive Garden in at least two years. Uh, yeah, it's probably been longer than that for me. But there are, you know, I'm, you I'm you, with you, John. you associate yeah. the Darden chain of restaurants. So there are some that I do go to. For instance, one of them is Longhorn Steakhouse. That's a really good one around here. Uh, Bahama Breeze is a good one. Um, been there a couple times. Um, but Seth, you have an interesting fact. You you have a friend of yours that's a chef at a high end restaurant out in Seattle area. Yeah, yeah, actually Portland, right? Um, okay, uh, right out of Portland. And I don't know if you've ever heard of Stumptown Coffee. 
No. If that's not familiar to you. Well, anyways, that's kind of one of the destinations here if, and uh, one of the restaurant owners that that uh, has a really high end. Very, I mean, always written up as one of the top ten places. I've heard of Portland Starbucks. Last... Have, you, have you heard of Starbucks, Seth? I've heard no, – hold, well, hold that thought. Put a pin in it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you're saying so, – so, Seth, you're saying Stumphouse Coffee is a restaurant or is a coffee place? No, here, I'll, I'll get to you. So Stumptown okay. Coffee is basically Portland's um, probably best-known coffee. That Premier have, outside of the, Portland, yeah, Oregon, folks. Portland, Oregon. Yes. The Portland, Oregon. So, so fantastic stuff. But Ava Jean's is their, their – uh, kind of their flagship restaurant that they have over here. Just one of – wonderful place. Anyways, chef from there, where do I see him posting – uh, on his Instagram account, I think is where I saw him, you know, uh, saying something. He's a good friend of mine, but he was talking about how he just cannot get enough well, of funny. the chicken parmesan at us at the Olive Garden. His employer will not be happy with that post if this guy has any kind of celebrity following. <laughs> not at all. Don't you ever say you go anywhere else besides Imogene's. <laughs> Yeah, so they're uh, so they're you know it's kind of funny like it, when I uh, um, years and years ago I would ask, ask I was ask uh, you know when we were waiting tables in college I would ask, ask the the cooks that I thought were great where do you like to eat and they would tell me some of the places that they would eat and I was like you're kidding me like that's not the top shelf place that they're going to but they love going places where there's great service the food's consistent you know and those are things that I think that are important for the most of us too is it, it's a value play right? it's kind of funny because um, you think about. Olive Garden and around the Boston area where there's so many unbelievably great Italian restaurants, it's not one of the ones that is top on my list, you know, when it comes to to those kind of restaurants. I mean I, I like it. I, yeah, I'll I'm be not, honest. I'm not a big I'm not a big Italian Oh you're not okay. Food. But, but that's what you take me every time I come visit. Fan. Yeah, I do. I mean, I like there's some dishes. I mean, you just can't. I mean, you can't go wrong throwing some pasta into a dish that's with some I'm meat and about. sauce. You know, it's not. It's hard to screw up. I mean. Let's break it down. I mean, that's this is simple facts, but I, I mean, when you go out to you know get a nice steak or you know, you know, a specific type of dish that does not include a, a generic carbohydrate, <laughs> it's a little bit harder to make and, and make it truly good. I mean, that's that's one thing. I mean, I think about cooking tunas and, and fish and steaks. I mean, there's a there's an art to that. Pasta, eh, not so much. Not so much. Tuna helper, hamburger helper. Is that which we were going with that like no, no. i was <laughs> oh i was looking at the uh, mcd stock oh, MCD. i'm just kidding okay. <laughs> <laughs> no this is not an endorsement to buy mcd yeah. stock <laughs> yeah, no endorsement yeah, here none of this is <laughs> or bk for that matter yeah BK. <laughs> i really like this next article actually i thought this was this was really fun to take a look at and uh this was um basically a 450 million Leonardo da Vinci painting. Seth, this that is what's crazy. Spot. It sold for 450 and a mm-hmm. month ago, before the auction actually took place, they were estimating that it would go for about $100 million, And it ended up being one of the largest buys ever, the most money ever spent on a, on a painting. And Seth, you did not team up with your family to buy this, did you? No, but I did note that the uh, the what was it? One of the the, the Saudi prince or who who brought who bought some this? Saudi prince? Yeah, yeah. They had a few extra bucks sitting around. Right, right. They noted that their favorite restaurant was the Olive Garden. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. It didn't Leonardo? It's amazing how these stories did Leonardo together sometimes. start the Olive Garden? <laughs> I think he did. <laughs> yeah. I think he did way back in ancient Italy. <laughs> it was part of his little design book. Yeah. No, but you know when you're looking at this article is pretty interesting. I mean, when you you know, back what was it in 2015? They had a couple other paintings sell. One was for 110 million, and the other was 179 million. A Picasso, a Picasso. Yeah. And so you take the you take these two and put them together. It's still not even encroaching. So, so the title of the article is: So you just brought bought a 450 million dollar Leonardo da Vinci painting. Now what? Not that this is a problem for most people reading the article yeah. that was written by Brian Boucher and Eileen Kinsella back on November 22nd, 2017. However, it is a problem for some people. And uh, it's kind of funny that the first paragraph of the article says, it's not hard to imagine a feature film based on the $450 million sale of Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi. 
Mm-hmm. In the movie version of the event, as soon as the hammer comes down, the auction house sends out decoy trucks and spreads disinformation on the dark web to thwart potential gangsters waiting to seize the work for their mobbed up bosses. But the reality is far more mundane, but no less complex. Don't worry. It still involves decoy trucks. There are numerous practical matters to consider, like packing, shipping, insurance, and tax liability. So as soon as the winning bid comes in, a host of legal and logistical procedures are set in motion. With more and more works coming in, eight and nine figure prices at auction. Like you were talking about Ben, about ben you are talking about one going for 110 million and then a Picasso for 170, 179 million in 2015. The stakes have never been higher when it comes to handling pricey works. So, okay, so dark web, multiple trucks. I'm just wondering, was this a Bitcoin transaction? Uh, it may have been. It may have. We're going to find that out later, probably. Um, but okay, so so when someone buys one of these paintings, they have to have like a whole team of people in place. Um, and and the the first one is you have to have an attorney, and that attorney helps to to do what to help mitigate um, tax liability, help make sure you're not uh, stung by. Restrictive export regulations. So this is this guy named John Cahill. He founded his own firm after he was serving as a general counselor for an auctioneer. And um, he talks about how, how important it is um, in, in order to, ha- to have proper counsel in place. I guess there's different um, – when you're buying it from different countries, there's different restrictions you have in place. But taxes is really one of those issues. And we're, you know, we're talking about taxes today. Really, not, We're not talking about taxes when it comes to buying $450 million paintings. But it says this. If you want to enjoy your Renaissance treasure in your New York apartment, you'd have to pay New York sales tax, which would run you around $36 million if you had bought that painting. Why not? I mean, a four hundred fifty million. <laughs> if you're Christmas buying it, time. I mean, think about it. It's not like he's hanging it in a, a cardboard box in his house. I mean, this is this is a painting. This is this is someone walking in, and their perspective is is like if you if you got if you walked in and you saw a painting, John, and you were so moved that you had to own it. What is the highest number? Forty five hundred dollars you might pay if you if it moved your soul. Wrap it up. Right, wrap that thing up, man. Yeah. I, I'm spending every. I mean, that's kind of the perspective I'm yeah, thinking this guy crazy. had here. Yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. So, so this guy Cahill talks about um, how people from California can park things in Oregon and Arizona without paying s- sales tax, um, mm-hmm. but without knocking these states at all, not every museum could deal with the crowds that Leonardo could bring or the security it would require. To get the full deduction, this guy Cahill says, the donor would need an income of $190 million. And if he or she wanted to take the full deduction in one year, they would need an income of $960 million. But if you just drop $450 million on a painting, you may well be in that very tax bracket. <laughs> you may have those tax concerns. Yeah. You know, I think this, this article is a great illustration of that there are things to do when it comes to taxes at every income level. It right. doesn't matter okay. where you are in the spectrum. Mm-hmm. Now, I mean, I think it's great. I mean, the, the idea that if you, if you loan your painting to an art museum for a period of time, you get a deduction on the taxes. I mean, that is a, you know, it's, a, it's the idea that you're giving back the time, you know, of, of, of the viewing of that painting as your charitable gift. Mm. Now, That's how I choose to be very charitable. Now, it's Benjamin in the year coming forward. Okay, what's interesting about that, though, is that precedent goes against, right? Like, I mean, that goes against, like, you can't deduct your time if you serve for a charity. Like, if you spend right, just time, right, you can't right. deduct that time. You wish you could. You wish you could. <laughs> but when you think about the time you're donating for the art, it is deductible in that caption. So people say, oh, well, your time's not deductible. Well, right here, time was deductible. So it's an interesting perspective how our, our tax law has uh, lots of ins and outs. Okay, so these guys need a lawyer. They also need a shipper. So once you buy a $450 million painting, they say that um, one of the big problems or one of the issues that um, the, the shipper constantly has is the fact that there's a majority of claims arise from um, problems when they're transporting. So we talk about insurance there. But listen to this. They said, they said this here. Uh, in the article. It's not unusual to have a com- 
complete communication blackout. So only one or two people know the exact plan of how it's getting to its location. Final details of the shipping route may be made very late in the game to maximize security. Other precautions could involve booking multiple flights and even making decoy shipments of similarly sized artworks at the same time. The extra security escorts, which both shippers acknowledge would be on duty, would be highly discreet so that the average Joe wouldn't be able to tell the difference between a routine shipment and a top value delivery. The truck that transports transports the work would also be state-of-the-art outfitted with shock absorbers that operate with airbag technology not old-fashioned springs as well as climate control gps tracking and alarm systems two drivers who at both companies also happen to be trained art handlers would be on hand in case one of them needed backup the loading area would provide proper light levels and protection from uv exposure and the crate that contains the work would also be high tech with a robust wood hybrid exterior and a vapor barrier inside that resists dampness those are all things, gentlemen, that you didn't think of when you were thinking about buying that. <laughs> no, I was just wondering if they had, you know, um, you know, a cardboard tube that I could roll up my my print in and take it home with me when I left my my art. As soon art. as you ask that question, they're like, <laughs> "Hang up the phone. This guy's not serious." Yeah. No, it's interesting. The level, the like, the the layer of risk here that that seems to be really like the heaviest focus and the concentration and trying to mitigate some of the risk that's you know post sale here of trying to hey, you're trying to make sure that there's theft is not something that there's uh that, that that doesn't happen in between a to z and but all the other factors they're like who who would have, i wouldn't have thought airbags need to come into play here <laughs> and i mean certainly humidity and temperature i i'd think that but then you're talking about like almost you know undercover secret service agents like in planes and multiple planes and all that i mean you know i there's got to be a movie a, made of this purchase. Half a okay. billion dollars. Okay, so that makes sense. The only thing going through my mind right now is the envisionment of like, you know, Jim Carrey and Jeff Daniels from Dumb and Dumber being like accidentally oh getting substituted into moving this. <laughs> 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 oh, are you an art handler? Absolutely. We move paintings right. in our house. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have we have the lawyer, the shipper, the insurer. You know what they do with these for insurance on these? And guys, we're all interested in insurance, but they basically do a lot of reinsurance. So they they right. split the insurance companies up, and they do it among multiple companies because no one wants to assume the risk of of having a four hundred dollar sure. million, uh, four hundred million dollar, four hundred fifty four hundred fifty million dollar painting um, <laughs> being uh, hurt in an accident or is just irreplaceable. So right. um, they they use what is called a quota share. Says Kate. Kate Buchanan, Vice President of Huntington T. Block Insurance Agency. Basically, you split the percentage of premium with all these insurers so they all have a piece of it. And then you also split the, the losses. So if you get 20 insurers to get in on it, it takes a certain percentage of the premium. If there is even a partial loss, they'll each take their piece. It spreads the risk out a bit. So, And probably the possibility of loss is very, very remote. However, if there is that loss, it could be a big issue. Yeah. 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 So after that, there's definitely the storage expert. So that was the other piece that that came in here. But you know what? We are going to curate here for a second on Money on Tap. <laughs> We're going to take a quick break. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at your money on tap dot com. A lengthy vacation requires some thoughtful and detailed planning, and few people would go on such a trip without the necessary preparation. On our Cliff Notes edition of Money on Tap, Seth Crossman shows us with his example that the same care and thoughtfulness should also be given to our retirement planning. This is a journey. This is a project that you have an opportunity to invest in and to uncover and identify how you want to live your life. And I think how many times, you know, we go on vacation. A great friend of mine took his whole family on a missions trip to Guatemala this last year. Mm -hmm. And that looked like a tremendous adventure. And how much planning does it take to get that to happen? I have no problem involving myself in creating a plan around something like that. And if I can get my mindset to be thinking that way, like, wow, I am planning the largest vacation of my life. How much fun can that be? And I can't wait to sit down and talk to you about that, right? Thanks for joining us for this Cliff Notes edition of Money on Tap with great tips from the pros in three-dimensional investing, utilizing insurance, brokerage, and fee-based planning. Now here's more Money on Tap with Seth, Ben, and John. <laughs> 
Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters, bringing out the professional's experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing. You can reach us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. You can also find us at Facebook or any of the other podcast venues out there. We appreciate you joining us today. And today we are talking about tax-free streams of income in your retirement. Uh, this is actually a really fascinating topic for us as planners at Brayshaw Financial Group. Uh, you know, a lot of the what we deal with all the time is income and how to generate income, create income, different types of income, offset income, and um, you know, try to have the most successful experience possible. If that's what your situation is, if you are uh, looking to try to uh, translate, you know, all this work, all this hard work and saving that you've been doing towards ultimately a retirement and having a successful experience in that. That's what we do at Brayshaw Financial Group. And that's what we're here to talk a little bit about today. Um, and we're not going to get, you know, we're not going to get too deep on all of the topics here, but there's, there's a lot to cover. John, you want to, you want to give us a, a little bit more there? You know, the title of our show today, as Seth mentioned, is tax-free streams of income and retirement. If you are going to have tax-free streams of income and retirement, guess what you need? You need to have some tax-free buckets to access those tax-free streams. And uh, if you listen to most of the financial press today out there, you hear everyone talking about the following ideas. Hey, here's what you need to do. You need to max your 401k out. There's no question. Max your 401k out. Um, you also want to max out any deductible contribution you get. You can get to an IRA. So while these things can really help with a tax bite now, they're actually setting you up for a problem later on. Let's talk about that, Ben. Well, you know, I, I mean, when you talk about what people are looking at inside their investing world, they're just looking at putting money away. They, they look at it as, hey, I'm going to check the box. I'm going to put it in the money. That's the simplest, easiest, fastest way to do it. Retirement plans, option A. Okay. Yep. And, you know, at the end of the day, people think, I don't want to hire a planner because that's going to cost me money, the money I don't have. And, you know, then I've got to evaluate everything they're doing and they're probably going to come up with something that's more complicated than maybe I understand. And I don't want to, you know, show my inability to understand investments and so forth. So to break it down here, option A is, you know, choose the employer's option. And option B is, you know, basically looking at other solutions that are outside the box. I mean, that's that's essentially what it is. And so when you go to a planner, you're actually looking at, hey, who am I going to work with, and are they going to be able to answer my concerns? Now, the number one concern you should have is, how much money do I get to keep? What is it that I'm going to invest? And at the end of the day, how much of that do I get to keep? And so what we do as planners is we help people actually build buckets of money, buckets of money that will actually help them later on to access those dollars tax-free. So, for instance, the first one that we talk about often, and this was um, created actually many, many years ago now, um, it was called the Roth IRA. So Roth IRAs have been around for a long time, and if you don't know what one is, stick around. We're going to bring you up to speed. A Roth IRA is really a special retirement account that you can fund with post-tax income, so you can't deduct those contributions that you make into it. But once you have done this, all future withdrawals that you've take from that Roth IRA are tax-free. That's a big point because if you think about it, there are regular IRAs you can uh, participate in. We call them traditional IRAs, and you're able to put so much money into those every year, but you get a tax break for doing that. So that sounds really good, and you might say, well, why would you ever recommend a Roth IRA when I can actually get a tax break for, for putting the money in now? Well, if you want a tax break later on, and that's what we're talking about here. A Roth IRA can be a very valuable tool for you to have. So understand, no upfront tax deduction for Roth IRA contributions as there is with a traditional. But on the other hand, Roth distributions are tax-free when you follow the rules. And because every penny that you stash into a Roth IRA is your money, it's not a tax-subsidized gift from Uncle Sam, you can tap your contributions um, anytime, uh, tax-free and penalty-free. I think you hit something really important there, John, which is kind of the flexibility option in that. Since you have paid taxes up front on that money, when you go ahead and contribute into that Roth, the accumulation can, can start to occur. Compounding can start to occur. There's, you know, there's no – sometimes people ask us, OK, so uh, um, you know, how, how's your Roth doing you know, as, a, as, a, like, as if a Roth is a investment vehicle sure. that has some kind of a return like a CD might have a return or an index fund or you know some kind of a a stock might have a return and and the fact is is it's just like a wrapper around your money that um you know allows it to go ahead and compound without 
you know, having uh, taxes taken out every year, like your 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 bank account interest might have, you know, reportable interest that you have to pay on those taxes. So it warehouses those monies for you. But it also has that option, that flexibility option for, um, you know, people to go ahead and use those contributions later, you know, just put the money in, take the money out when you need to, just as long as you're not taking gains out on that uh, b- before 59 and a half, you don't have, um, you know, a, a taxable situation happening that way. Whereas, you know, the, uh, the traditional IRAs, if you take money out prior to 59 and a half, because you've, you know, haven't paid taxes on that, then guess what? There's automatically a 10% hit off that money. That's a tax, you know, liability that way. So having that flexibility option, I think is one of the things that I, I, I really like about, a Roth and when trying to do a little bit of planning is asking, you know, questions like, well, what is the money for? When are you going to need the money? And, and so those might be some of the options that, that, that not only future tax free income in a Roth might offer, uh, offer, but you know, the flexibility option to maybe, you know, use some of those monies prior to that 59 and a half kind of a cutoff that, that, uh, that, that starts to happen for your traditional IRA or your, uh, qualified accounts is what we, we call most of those monies. So there's some different expectations that people have when it comes to their money. And one of the things that we are often coaching people uh, around is the fact uh, is about tax rates. Now, Ben, I know we've spent a lot of time, actually just recently we're, we're talking with a client about uh, tax rates going up in the future. Not that we have a crystal ball and know exactly what will happen, but if you take a look at what's going on in our economy today. Well, you know, I do believe tax rates are going to go up, and I think we're naive to think that they're, you know, I, somewhat, <laughs> I remember a couple of years ago, a few years ago, I said to a client, I said, um, well, I, you know, tax rates are going to go up, and they're like, oh, well, I don't think they're going to go up. And I said, well, do you think they're going to stay the same and, and or go down? I was like, we have two, you know, what, $20 trillion in national debt. We have an unfunded Social Security liability. We have the largest demand on retirement systems coming down the road with the baby boomers. I was like, I don't really see how we're going to financially afford the retirement we've promised. And, uh, you know, they're like, well, you know what? I don't, I don't think it's going down. Now, there's a lot of tax reform discussion. Matter of fact, there's a vote coming up here on, you know, what the new taxes are going to be and all sorts of, you know, gossip around, you know, corporate tax rates, personal tax yep. rates. Who's By the time pay- you hear this, you'll, you'll know all about it. You'll probably it. know all about it. We'll, will too. <laughs> But, you know, I think, I think the thing is, is that, you know, we may have a tax cut to certain this, that, and the other thing, and I, and I think that's going to be great for our economy in the short term. Um, but, you know, without addressing our debt, without addressing our budget, those are things that, you know, if we don't do it as a, as a country and we really start focusing on it, we're, we're going to have a loss. Now, just to jump back, John, I mean, as you were talking about, you know, the Roth IRA, you know, and there's a comp- there's companies out there that are now offering a Roth 401k. So if you can do a Roth option, that kind of after tax money, um, into a Roth 401k, that's great. That's an option for you. What I've really found, John, and I, you know, Seth, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I really just find that, and I don't mean this to be harm to anybody in the way I'm saying it, but you know, just easiest is best. It's almost like I don't want to be, I don't want to take the extra time and the effort to go and sit with a planner and really discuss through this stuff. But I can get this money deducted at my company and I never need to think about it. I spend a few minutes on it. I open my account. So if a Roth 401k is available at work, that may be the easiest solution for you. But don't just go with the easiest solution because that's what's available. No, go with the solutions that's going to make the most sense for you in the long term. So generally, let me just say this. Roth IRAs make the most sense if you expect your tax rates to be higher during retirement than your current rate. And that, that is it. Well, you know, I, true, I, even, true. I, I agree with that, but I, I, I disagree with the reasoning behind it because I look at it this way. A Roth IRA gives you the most control now for what tomorrow is going to be. Whether it's higher or lower, or this, that, or the other thing, you're actually establishing tax control today on your income tax. Now, we did talk about that article, what was it, last week or the week before, where some gentleman, you know, came up with the idea that I talked about for a while, which is having a national sales tax to right. tax monies that we haven't been taxed on. But I think, honestly, if you can get some of your dollars out of, you know, a tax scenario that you know what the numbers are today. We know historically what they've been. You, you get a little bit of power and control, and you have a little destiny opportunity here to, to make, 
make things the way you, you want them to be. And I will tell you there's a little bit more control that you have with the Roth IRA as opposed to the traditional IRA later on because when you do hit that magic age of 70 and a half, with a traditional IRA, you are forced to take required minimum distributions. We call them RMDs in the business. Mm -hmm. And um, you're forced to do that with a traditional IRA. With the Roth IRA, you're not. So if you don't want to take the money out, you don't need to take it out. But there's really a, uh, a question a lot of people have out there. You know, I've heard about this Roth IRA thing. Am I even eligible? But do you know that if you can, you can contribute to a Roth IRA at any age as long as you have earned income from a job? That means they're appropriate from a teenager starting his first job to maybe someone that's uh, greeting people at Walmart that's 80 years old. Um, so, but the, the, the question of eligibility is certainly there. So first things first, Roth IRAs have eligibility limits or income eligibility, income eligibility limits. So if you make too much money, you can't contribute to a Roth IRA, but with a median household income of about 50000 most Americans can qualify for a Roth IRA contribution. If your income's too high, you can convert some or all of the assets in your traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, but you might have to pay some taxes in order to make that happen. So for 2017, let's talk about this. Here's what you can put into a Roth IRA depending upon your income, your age, and your tax filing status. You can contribute the maximum 5500 to a Roth IRA, 6500 if you're age 50 or older by the end of the year. If you're single or the single head of a household, your modified adjusted gross income is less than 118000 You can then contribute. But if you are married filing jointly, you can contribute the maximum amount to a Roth IRA if your modified, gross, your modified adjusted gross income is less than 186000 That's a lot of numbers, John. <laughs> That's a lot of numbers. So, I mean, honestly, when it comes down to it, you know, when you sit down with your tax guy, which is usually what April fourteenth, when most people actually sit with their tax person, um, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> they love it when you call yeah. them. Hey, I need to file my taxes. I heard, I heard that's something I got to do this year. I need to file my extension. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that's what their response is. But you know, when you sit down with them, they they they're they're as busy as they possibly can, and and people don't engage their CPAs really. And you know, at the end of the year, when they're you know at the end of the calendar year, they're CPAs are bored. They're sitting around there in December saying, I got nothing to do. Right. You, know, you need to engage your CPA now, you know, be well before tax season. Once tax season starts, getting them to actually do some tax planning with you, if that's the person you're going to go to, it's hard. So you have to do some intentional effort in your part to, to find out, hey, is there anything I can do to lower my income? You know, on paper, so that I could get into a Roth. Maybe, maybe you're making too much money. That's a common problem. People are just, even as self-employed business owners, how many people get knocked out of the Roth and they still feel like they're not making enough money to put away for retirement? Happens yeah. every day. We also see a lot of the time the uh, the backdoor Roth, kind of that access, that direction. You know, contributing to either the uh, traditional uh, IRAs or some 401ks, and then basically siphoning off some of those funds, rolling them into the Roth. There is, there is, you know, a a taxable event when that when that happens. That's a great yeah. point, and those are some of the things we do. And go keep going. Sorry. Yeah. Well, you know what I was about to do is I was about to let people know that they're listening to Money on Tap, and we are going to take a quick break. We're talking about tax free retirement income stuff that we love to talk about here at Money on Tap, and ways that we can hopefully get into that. Maybe back into those. Maybe it's a contribution. Maybe it's a, a different type of a of a uh, scenario here. We're going to get into some of that. I think it's uh, interesting. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. Hi, my name is Ben Brayshaw, one of the co-hosts of Money on Tap. If you have questions when it comes to your retirement and are looking for a personalized solution, contact us at Brayshaw Financial Group. In today's volatile stock market, we can help you plan to find your successful retirement solution. Am I saving enough? Am I saving into the right places? Do my investments match my appetite for risk? Do I have a tax strategy that is going to help me keep more of what I earn? How can I maximize my Social Security income? If you are like most people, you are getting closer and closer to your retirement and may be wondering if you're taking the right steps. If you're in retirement, you may be wondering, am I maximizing my income while preserving my estate and caring for my family? We talk about all things financial in what we call three-dimensional investing, putting a plan around your financial future. If you feel that now is the time to start getting the answers to some of these questions for your own situation, Give us a call at Brayshaw Financial Group at 855-226-8551. Headquartered in Bedford, New Hampshire, we have offices throughout New England and across the country. We would love the opportunity to show you how we can help. There's absolutely no cost or obligation just to meet with us, and we welcome you to our office. Call us at 855-226-8551.
Now back to Money on Tap with Ben Brayshaw, John Ryder, and Seth Cressman. Welcome back. You're listening to Money on Tap, your personal finance headquarters. We're bringing out the professional's experience and some fun in what we call three-dimensional investing. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. Uh, that is actually the the website that we have is Your Money on Tap. And uh, one of the things that we love to do there is not only, you know, uh, publish some blogs, uh, we also put up our past episodes of Money on Tap. So you can go ahead and find something that that is uh, relates to you because that's what we're here about. We're, we're, we're here to help and to educate and to bring people along beside us to have these conversations. Um, and sometimes that's an easy way for you to go ahead and grab access to that information and make it your own. Uh, give us a call at 855-226-8551. We'd love to help you through some of these concepts that we're working through today. So we are talking about Roth IRAs. We're talking about the opportunity for you to invest in them. You know, it's getting down towards the end of the year here, and you may be thinking, well, it's too late. I'm not able to contribute now. But you know what? The uh, the government actually allows us to contribute. In fact, for next year, it's going to be April 18th, 2018. So if you um, are able to contribute in the first several months of next year, that may be the, the place to go. So we've been talking about Roth IRAs, the benefit of them, one of the benefits being that you don't have to withdraw the money uh, later on. You can actually leave it in your account. Another benefit is the fact that you can pull those dollars out tax-free. Another benefit is the fact that you can actually just put the money in there on a regular basis. You don't have to put it all at once. You can do a systematic savings into that Roth IRA. Um, and also what's nice about the Roth is the fact that you can actually do what is called a catch-up provision. Same with the traditional, but if you um, are – age 50 or older, I think some of us here on, on the radio show are approaching that age. Maybe one of us here are approaching that age fairly soon. Um, but you're able to put more John, in. So you're, I really appreciate you being our senior advisor. Yes, yes I'm happy to be the senior advisor here. <laughs> um, but you can put an extra $1,000 into your, into your Roth IRA, making it a total of 6500 So IRAs, Roth IRAs, are really the first bucket which we have discussed here. But let's shift gears a little bit and talk about a bucket that we've been helping f- uh, folks build over time uh, for, for many, many years now. So if you maybe have contributed to a Roth IRA, maybe you filled that bucket up, maybe you're making too much money to contribute uh, to a Roth IRA because of the um, the limits that the government puts on it. But maybe you're looking for something more. Maybe you're looking for a, a different bucket where you can actually build uh, a bucket that which will, which will allow you to have tax-free streams of income. Let's talk about that, Ben. Let's go forward with that. Yeah, you know, this is something we have used pretty heavily with a lot of self-employed people. The guys are making too much money to be able to contribute. Yeah, and it's not even sometimes it's not even too much. It's just that um you know they're making they're making a good living. Yeah. You know, they're um you know, they could be it's anybody from a plumber to an electrician to a uh to a an executive uh on Wall Street. Um somebody who's who says, "Hey, I put money away in retirement." But I'm really starting to understand this tax thing, this horrendous every year I owe the IRS money and I don't want to get stuck in retirement, you know, being laden with having, you know, a gigantic tax bill and trying to maintain my lifestyle, not knowing where taxes are going. Majority of people end up with their dollars in the 401k, right. a fully taxable event. We have many, many of our clients that their largest asset beside their house is that 401k plan. And as a result, every time they pull money out of that in retirement, then they're facing a tax bill. Yeah. And, you know, Seth, I mean, we, we've done a lot of these with business owners, West Coast, East Coast, you name it, all over the country. And um, this is not something new. I mean, this is not a new concept. This is not a new idea. But the, I would call it the technology or the mechanics have changed in the last five, ten years that have made this kind of a newer, fresh opportunity with real, with real uh, legitimacy. I would say that prior to that, this, this type of program would have been speculative more so yeah. Um, yeah. In, in what it might produce for you. But um, there's a few companies, this one particular um, that I'm certain of, that I actually have myself, which is it's basically creating a income, a tax-free income out of life insurance that's guaranteed on distribution for life. 
Okay, so you're actually talking like a cash value type of insurance, so different yeah. than a term insurance yeah. type of thing. Well, everyone, I think, is probably familiar with a term insurance policy where you have um, very, very cheap coverage that you uh, purchase and is for a term, for a temporary period of time. It might be for a 10-year term or a 20-year term or a 30-year term. As long as you keep on paying the premiums, then you have the insurance in place. But you're not building up any kind of cash value in that temporary insurance. But with this permanent insurance, you're talking actually about a different type of policy that actually does build cash value, and you can access those values tax free perhaps later on. Yeah, I mean I think I, I think the thing is is that people hear insurance and they just start running. And if you are and you're turning the show off, you're missing out on probably one of the biggest opportunities that's changed in a long time. Right. I was gonna say, you know, that like right now people are referencing the person that knocked on their door and uh, showed up at their house for an appointment and tried to sell them a really expensive whole life policy that was you know, this or that, but that, that was kind of the idea yeah. that pops into most people's head that when you say permanent insurance or a whole, you know, that kind of a scenario that's going to have an accumulation on the, uh, the backside of it. And, yeah. uh, and you're right. If you're, if you're, if you're listening and that's exactly what you're thinking, you need to, it's a hard thing to do. And we, we all have this, but it's hard to put aside our first impression or that, ju- you know, that judgment call that, that whatever that, that might be for us right now. But we're going to ask that for at least a period of time, go ahead and keep that in the back you know, in your back pocket, but for at least a window here, listen to what we're talking about and consider, you know, um, what the, what, what this possibly means, what, the, what we're talking about, how Ben's going to be talking about this product in this type of a set is totally different than what you probably conceived in the past. So, you know, when it comes to, you know, basically creating, you know, tax-free income, the focus is on real value. Like how much value are you bringing inside the insurance world? And, you know, we've, we've chatted with people. It's, it's like when it comes to life insurance, no one wants to own it. And in this application, you want to own as little as possible. Now, the idea around this is like, hey, you want to own as little as possible. Not exactly what every insurance salesman is going to tell you is buy more insurance. But actually, what we want to do is buy as little life insurance as possible and actually overfund it at, to the very highest level that you're legally allowed to do. I mean, it's the government knows this tax loophole exists so much, in fact, that they actually stop you from putting a certain amount of money into life insurance based on how much insurance you're buying. That should tell you something. That should say, hmm, why would they, why would they create a limit? Now, when it comes to this insurance, you know, ultimately it grows tax deferred. We call it a rich man's Roth. Um, we've called it the Roth alternative. It's, it, it allows it. It doesn't have an income limitation. We use be it. Be your own bank. Yeah, be That's... your own bank. All these different like acronyms, they use it. In the last five to 10 years, you know, companies have created basically an income chassis on it that would give people a lifetime income without it defaulting. Okay, so you're saying that they're getting a lifetime income from their insurance policy from the cash value. Yes, exactly. And um, and the reason why that's so important and the reason that, you know, in, financial planners would sell these types of policies, um, not this one, but these types of policies, you know, prior to 10 years ago in hopes that they could project some sort of income from it on a loan withdrawal schedule. Based upon dividends, that type of thing. And, yeah, I mean, basically... You know, they would project these things and they really would have zero intent on taking the money out because the insurance, when you buy lots of insurance and put lots of money in it, it could potentially be very, you know, commission laden. But buying less and less life insurance and overfunding it doesn't make it commission laden. It's actually doing exactly the opposite. You're buying the tool and you're not buying the commission. So that's a little bit helpful in that capacity because you don't want it to be overburdened by either the cost of insurance, how much people are getting paid, all of those different things. But in the olden days, they would just sell them based on commission and talk about wonderful income opportunities. But as soon as those things were turned on and income was withdrawn, if those didn't perform properly or something happened and they crashed, it'd be an enormous tax hit. Gigantic, and that tax hit would be catastrophic to the person who owned the insurance. And what would happen is, is if you had taken four or five hundred thousand dollars of income out of that policy over ten or fifteen or twenty years, and all of a sudden there was the policy lapsed and crashed, you'd have that four or five hundred thousand dollars come back to you as a, a taxable hit, and that's a huge, huge problem for people, and probably a huge lawsuit for the advisor. So they would sell these things, and then. 
do the ex, you know other planning, and then they would never turn the income on because they were scared of of the potential liability to the client and to themselves. We have a couple of different vendors, one particularly that we use that gives a guaranteed lifetime income that you can utilize inside the life insurance chassis so that when you do turn on the income, it would, one, be tax-free under the tax code that it provides, and two, the insurance company would give, it, give you the guaranteed lifetime payout. This is something that if you're listening and you're not quite sure what we're talking about, could change your life. And at least brings back control, control in a lot of different areas. We've talked with CFOs, CEOs, you know, business owners, you name it. We've run through the numbers 15 different ways, opened up every can of worms that anyone thought could potentially be there. Uh, We have broken it down in each and every way. And what I found is this is actually a really wonderful catch-up tool for retirement. I'm thinking of a client out in uh, Oregon, Seth, you and I met with, and we were talking about it. He just come out of a divorce, a business owner, and great guy, and just talking about how you know I kind of kind of need to catch up. I've you know been financially devastated by you know the separation in my life and and so forth. And we were actually started talking about is it how much you're worth or how much income you get when you retire. Now that's a that's a big conversation we have with a lot of clients and a big conversation we have a lot with a lot of people but when you take the tax free element to it it takes the tax question mark out of play because when you break down the numbers if you were to actually get to keep $50,000 out of your IRA on a distribution so you get a check after taxes for 50 grand okay you might be in a 30 40% tax bracket you know and then you're looking at it saying, well, I had to take seventy five or eighty thousand dollars out of my IRA to get that fifty thousand. Like you always say, Ben, at the end of the day, what yeah. do you have? What do you get to keep? Yeah. And then if you had eighty thousand dollars you took out of your IRA and you would use Monte Carlo, right? Well, Monte Carlo would say that you need about one point six million at five percent distributions. You need one point six million in your IRA to get eighty thousand out a year. It'd be reasonably likely that you'll never run out of and money. Monte Carlo basically saying this is basically putting some limits on. So you have a good clear yeah. idea of what you could take out in the percentage chance of not running out of money. Yeah, it's just like running the Vegas odds. I'm not gonna run out of money. How much should I take out? People use between four and five percent. So you take five percent, you work it backwards, that's one point six million. I mean, you have to put a lot of money away to get there. What we've found is that through these programs for people, we've been able to get that $50,000 of tax-free income without having to worry about getting to the $1.6 million. Matter of fact, significantly less contributions. Or worrying about the – many times when people are trying to play catch-up when it comes yeah. to their retirement, if they've had a tough uh, road for many years, then they start taking more risk and taking uh, a lot more risk than they should be taking to achieve the rate of return that they need to get. Right. And, you know, we're not, we're using kind of generic rates of return inside the S&P on this stuff and, and so forth. But there's an underlying guarantee and we go through those pieces and, you know, what that is. But what I have found is this, when people are taking the assumption that the market's going to do X, well, it has to do X in the retirement plan as well, you know, and that's the piece. The real difference in this is whether you're focused on what the income is you get to keep or whether you're focused on the asset you get to build. So if you're looking at the IRA and you want to get to the $1.6 million to get your 50000 out and you're hoping that you're just going to live off the interest and keep your principal, well, you have $1.6 million in hopes at the end. On top of this, Ben, that we're talking about, as far as the income structure, there's also some different things that I think uh, that listeners need to understand is the fact that when it comes to this permanent life insurance um, that we're talking about here, there are some different riders which can make a huge, tremendous difference for people down the road. There's one called a critical illness rider, a chronic illness rider, a terminal illness rider. All those are designed that if there's something major that happens to you while you are living, maybe it's not enough to kill you, but it's enough that it could be diabetes, it could be stroke, it could be heart attack, um, that you can actually turn those policy riders on and turn it into income for you later on. But um, I know we've primarily been talking about income here, but those riders can be very valuable. I know you've seen it with a client directly that had one of those critical illness riders. So, you know, that's, this is a great opportunity for a lot of people who are playing catch-up. So if you're in the catch-up question mark, this is a good conversation. But, you know, there's other things that we've done for clients, and this isn't the only area we've brought tax-free income into these two areas. I had one client, and this is a quick tidbit for somebody that might be out there listening, came to us looking to retire, looking at income, and they were trying to create tax-free income. We're going through all the different pieces. I looked at their tax return. We went through it. 
and they had two hundred fifty thousand plus dollars in passive losses on their tax return they had acquired over their lifetime. And we were able to build a passive income generator so that they would get tax free income, basically pulling out those losses out of their tax return over a period of time. There's a lot of things you can do to start speculating, you know, where taxes are going to go. But the truth is, is getting that control is really, really important. <clears throat> Yeah, John, you highlighted something that uh, basically that's exactly what Kira and I were looking to accomplish for ourselves was how do we, you know, first of all, get ourselves covered as cheap as possible in that insurance category. And then how do we shore up some of the holes, like some of the pitfalls, those 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 riders can do the critical illness? You know, what if what if something happens? What if I get cancer? Kira gets cancer along that journey. We need some way to be able to protect you know, what we've accomplished in, up to that point without, um, you know, totally, uh, you know, pulling apart our life to try to fix, you know, an illness or to fix a situation like that with ourselves. And at the end of the day, if nothing happens in not either one of those categories, we're looking at, um, you know, d- having done probably pretty well in a program like this based off of historics that we we should be doing OK and have created some decent um a bucket of income, future bucket of income and the flexibility around that, kind of like that Roth, you know, if there's something that's going on in our lives and we're like, Hey, you know what? We've got this money over here. We want to go ahead and fund a wedding. We want to, we want to, you know, do some college kind of planning. Those are some of the other options that these, uh, programs have available that we talk about on a very, very regular basis on, on how to help people fund some of those goals. And this is a great, uh, a great way to accomplish some of those needs that, and those goals that you might have. So you're listening to money on tap, uh, we've been talking about tax-free streams of income in your retirement. That was kind of the thought I had is, is John, you hit something personal for me, close to home for me. Um, and I love having options. I love having flexibility in um, in our planning environment. What did you guys have before we need to hit the road here? So, yeah, Seth, I mean, if, if people didn't hear anything today about what to do or how to do it, the one thing you want to leave with is that controlling your tax distributions – or controlling the money you get to keep and knowing how much you get to keep in retirement is your number one priority in retirement right now. And people in our country are subject to a lot of unforeseen taxable holdings. that They don't know what to do and how to do anything with them. So that's what I want to leave you with. That's my thoughts, Seth. Well, this has been a lot of fun, you guys. I love the topic. Tax-free streams of income for your retirement. You're listening to Money on Tap. You know what? Thank you for joining us today. You can reach us at 855-226-8551 or email us at info at yourmoneyontap.com. Please, we appreciate those emails that come in on some of these ideas that you'd like us to approach or talk about here on air. Uh, you, the listener, are very important to us and what uh, what's going on in your life. We appreciate you sharing all that feedback and, um, and spending that time with us here today. We'll talk to you next week. Thanks a lot, you guys. The views expressed are not necessarily the opinion of this radio station and should not be construed directly or indirectly as an offer to buy or sell any securities mentioned herein. Investing is subject to risks, including loss of principal invested. No strategy, product, material, or tool mentioned can assure a profit nor protect against loss. Please note that individual situations can vary. Therefore, the information, products, materials, or tools mentioned should be relied upon when coordinated with individual professional advice. Past performance is not a guarantee of future results. This show may be subsidized in whole or in part by a product sponsor or issuer. Securities and advisory services offered through SagePoint Financial Incorporated, member FINRA SIPC, and a registered investment advisor. All other services offered through Brayshaw Financial Group, LLC, are independent of SagePoint Financial. SagePoint Financial and Brayshaw Financial Group do not provide tax or legal advice. Main office is located at 116 South River Road, Bedford, New Hampshire. 03110 and can be reached at toll free 855 226 8551.